Um, maybe before we get started, I'll offer a bit of a disclaimer that sort of addresses the um, formatting of our panels today. Um, so we've structured the panels in a bit of a different way. Um, we've kind of like opened this up to a kind of more fluid, larger dialogue rather than speaking directly towards the um, the panelists work in more of kind of a formal lecture format. So um, we're really excited for the conversation that's going to come out of this. And yeah. Um, so for our first panel, we're having this themed around the uh, topic of the Uncanny Valley. Um, and this is kind of formatted around the larger question of what are the productive reinterpretive and misinterpretive spaces between physical reality and digital reconstructions of the environment. So by embracing the gap between physical reality and digital reconstructions, designers can explore hybrid practices that move beyond high fidelity replication, using the space to imagine alternative realities, techniques, and futures. So this session will examine how the inevitable inaccuracies in digital simulations of nature can open up new possibilities for design. So today we're joined by two panelists, Karen McCloskey and Joe Paradiso, and we're moderated by Andrew Witt. Um, Andrew Witt is the uh, Associate Professor of Practice in Architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, um, teaching and researching on the relationship of geometry and machines to perception, design, construction, nature. Witt is also the co-founder with Tobias Nolt of Certain Measures, a Boston, Berlin-based design and technology studio that combines imagination and evidence for systematic and scalable approaches to spatial problems. The work of certain measures is in the permanent collection of the Center Pompidou, has been exhibited at the Pompidou, Barbican Center, Fulturum, Hauster, Culturen de Wael, among others. Additionally, Andrew Witt's personal work can be featured, has been featured at Storefront for Art and Architecture, and in 2017, certain measures were finalists for the Zumtel Bell Award, both young professionals and applied innovation categories. So, Andrew is the author of many books that include Formulations, Architecture, Mathematics, Culture, Light Harmonies, The Rhythmic Photographs of Heinrich Heisenberger, and Studies in the Design Lab. He's a fellow of the Canadian Center of Architecture, a McDowell, a Graham Foundation, Harvard Data Science Initiative grantee, and a World Fi Frontiers Forum pioneer, as well as a young pioneer and a 2015 nominee for the Sharnikov Prize. Um, I'd love to hand it over to Andrew Witt to give an introduction to both of our panelists. Great. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be involved with this panel and just generally uh, this, this symposium. I think it's a very timely topic and a topic which I think uh, we'll have some hopefully fresh conversations around. So I have the great pleasure to introduce first uh, Karen McCloskey. So Karen is an associate professor of landscape architecture at the University of Pennsylvania's uh, Weizmann School of Design. She's co-founder with Keith uh, Vandersis of PEG Office of Landscape and Architecture and co-founder with Keith and Sean uh, Burkholder of the Environmental Modeling Lab or MLab at Penn. Their work focuses on the opportunities and limitations enabled by advancements in digital modeling and how the assumptions, embedding, uh, in, assumptions embedded uh, in our methods and tools shape our understanding of landscapes and environments. Uh, their work has been acknowledged through numerous publications, exhibitions, awards, uh, including a Pew Fellowship of the Arts uh, and analysis and planning awards from the American Society of Landscape Architecture and World Landscape Architecture for their work uh, in the Galapagos Islands. They're authors of uh, Dynamic Patterns, Visualizing Landscapes in a Digital Age, guest editors of uh, LA Plus Geo and LA Plus Simulation. Uh, Karen is the editor-in-chief of uh, LA Plus, where she currently is editing three volumes on the theme Sense, Environment, uh, and Media. Uh, she's co-curator and co-editor of the symposium exhibition and book, Design with Nature Now. Uh, and with her MLAB colleagues, she's uh, convened the symposium Instruments of Change in 2022, out of which grew a volume edited by Karen and Keith. Media Matters uh, in Landscape Architecture, uh, which will be out this spring. So with that, we'll turn the time over to Karen. Is this on? Yes, OK. Uh, well, given the rapid advancement of digital technology in the last two decades, including the development of GPS and relatively inexpensive in situ sensors, it's, it, we often tend to think of sensing landscapes as something recent. Of course, we're going back over 50 years of multispectral imaging f through Landsat. And even prior to Landsat, we had uh, photography uh, with cameras mounted to airplanes. 
So even though new technologies are quite different from their predecessors, when, we, when it comes to remote sensing for interpreting landscape through imagery and how classification works, those are developed out of analog methods. But there is no question that the digital technologies that we have uh, to, that we're using increasingly to understand landscapes and their evolution are changing our understandings of the world we live in. Um, this is my favorite example of classification and the problems with classification in land cover interpretation, um, such as whether something's a forest or a wetland. We tend to ignore the outliers. Um, and Susan Lee Starr and Jeffrey Boker talk about um, the usefulness of every successful standard, so something shared across multiple groups, um, has a classification system. So this is something we think a lot about when it comes to landscape. Um, so in terms of the work we're doing right now at the M Lab, we are using satellite data combined with multispectral imaging with low altitude drones and in-field surveying to monitor rapidly changing uh, coastal wetlands, mostly in New Jersey. Um, wetlands are incredibly um, spectrally elusive. Um, they're very hard to model and map how they're changing because of all of the asynchronicities among tides, cloud cover, satellite orbits, and so on. So pr it uh, provides a lot of challenges um, in that process. So anyone who works with their own data knows how subjective they are and how much interpretation goes into the maps and models that we typically use as the so-called base files for our, our landscape designs. Um, and so we're... Um, I'm really excited for Peter's book to come out. <laughs> and uh, we're very fond of Jennifer Gabriz's work, um, who talks about sensing not in terms of established subjects with prosthetics or where environmental sensors provide new environmental knowledge to established subjects, but rather how sensing changes the relationships through which subjects act. Um, so on a practical level, you, the use of these tools allows us to bypass the limits of existing data sets, um, to understand la landscapes over time, and to keep working with them over time. But obviously, it opens up much broader questions about the production of environmental knowledge. So how we collect data, how we interpret data, um, shape our landscapes in ways that are as um, significant as bulldozers and pipelines, but much harder to see how they do that. And now, of course, with climate change, um, it's bringing levels of uncertainty that we're really just beginning to grapple with. Fantastic. So I also have the great pleasure to introduce uh, Joe Paradiso. So Joe is the Alexander W. Dreyfus Professor and Associate Academic Head of the Program on Media Arts and Sciences at the Media Lab at MIT, where he directs the Responsive Environments Group, uh, which explores how sensor networks augment and mediate human uh, experience, interaction, and perception. So after two years of developing precision uh, drift chambers at the Lab for High Energy Physics at ETH in Zurich, he joined uh, Draper Lab, where his research encompassed, um, the, encompassed spacecraft control systems, image processing algorithms, underwater sonar, and precision alignment sensors for large energy physics detectors. Uh, he joined the Media Lab in 1994, where his current research interests include wireless sensing systems, wearable and body sensor networks, uh, sensor systems for built and natural environments, energy harvesting and power management for embedded sensors, ubiquitous pervasive computing, uh, and the Internet of Things, human computer interfaces, space based systems, uh, and interactive music media. So, we have a pretty wide gamut there. Uh, he's written over 350 publications and frequently lectures in these areas. Uh, in his spare time, he enjoys Designing, building electronic, uh, designing and building electronic and music synthesizers, um, composing electronic soundscapes, and seeking out edgy and unusual music while traveling the world. Uh, his installations have also been shown at many notable worldwide artistic venues, uh, ranging from Ars Electronica in Linz uh, to the Museum of Modern Art. Thank you very much, Andrew. And it's uh, wonderful to be uh, here again at the GSD. It's, it's always great to visit you guys. I've got many of you in my classes, but uh, nice to actually be on your turf uh, today. And uh, I resonate a lot with the title, The Uncanny Valley of Sensing and Representation. Uh, we tend to embrace the uncanny valley for a lot of our work, at least uh, the stuff I'll talk about here. It's, it's kind of interesting to play with, with, with the edge of that. Uh, I think it's it's really relevant now the way everything is is, is changing and coming together representation and sensing. 
Um, our group, as you, as you heard from Andrew, and you can see here on this slide, looks at sensing at all kinds of scales, from wearables to a lot of work with wearables, uh, sensors for the built environment, uh, sensors for landscape. We're actually working a lot now with National Geographic, putting out uh, sensors to track uh, endangered bumblebees by recognizing their buzz, and collars for wild African dogs to see how the uh, changes in the environment are affecting them. And m more and more, we're doing projects in space. We're actually landing a little micro rover, probably the world's smallest rover on the moon, uh, beginning of next year in the next lander, uh, the IM2. Um, it's intriguing now to think about sensing getting everywhere, how that connects to people in different ways. Uh, this is a cover uh, story of Scientific American that I wrote with one, one of my students in 2015 when we've been driving virtual worlds with sensor data for a while. And it's kind of intriguing to think about how perception just expands by, by tunneling into all this sensor data uh, and, and really widening what you perceive, changing the whole definition of the here and now. Uh, we did a few different projects. The one I'll talk about here uh, is our Tidmarsh project. Uh, just uh, south of Boston is uh, the community of Plymouth. Many of you know it. Uh, a lot of the cranberry industry in the state was uh, centered there and in southern Massachusetts. Uh, one of our, our, our founding faculty, the Media Lab, Gloriana Davenport, co-owns a large 600-acre cranberry farm there, and she has turned it over to uh, conservation, working with Mass Audubon. And uh, most of the landscape has been transformed into a natural wetland. So to grab uh, a capture of this, we decided to put sensors all over the place. We built our own network. We put sensors all over to capture this whole thing of restoration as it was going on. You can see you know, different networks, sensors of all kinds. We built our own embedded sensor that could measure you know, soil properties, because it is a wetland, but also measure lots of other things. We put in microphones, and we put in cameras, and uh, all kinds of other things. Uh, but, you know, we, we worked with wetland, wetland hydrologists to understand what was happening through the data, but we also used this information to tunnel into virtual worlds. So this is a video of the virtual Tidmarsh. There's even music here, which I don't know if you can hear in this, in this audio, but we love making music out of the data, too. There you go. So the music comes from the temperature and the humidity uh, and the location. Uh, of course, it's an avatar landscape. Uh, already, this is about uh, 10 years old. If it rained, it rained. If it uh, got cloudy, it got cloudy. Sunny, sunny. We had different ways of looking at the landscape. Uh, so you, know, you can change lenses. We had animals that would uh, basically live off the sensor data and change their appearance, depending on whether it's been hot, humid, dry, so on and so forth. And uh, we could change the musical mapping and the visual mapping. This is a different musical mapping done by Evan Zaporin um, with one of my students. Evan's a composer at MIT. So again, lots of ways to take this data and bring it up to people. And again, embracing the Uncanny Valley, uh, we went even further with the animals and uh, made them into ghosts. So this is not not looking at all like any kind of animal. This is a represent representation of the sensor data, but it's appearing in certain views of the landscape. And again, depending on how it's been condition-wise, you can see the animal transform and change. Uh, we also love the idea of... Uh, uh, changing your perception when you're there. What if you're at Tim Marsh, you have sensors and microphones everywhere, can you actually tunnel the audio from all the microphones into your perception, in this case with bone conduction headphones, so when you move around, when you move your head, it's like your senses are expanded because you're hearing through these microphones and assets we have all over the landscape, but hearing as if your ears are there. Uh, and this is the one wearable I built that I did not want to take off. You know, my perception was broadened. It was an enlightening experience. Dan Gager is actually an affiliate in my group. He designed all of the great uh, noise-canceling headphones and earbuds and bows. For him, this was a different experience. So augmenting people to give them a richer connection to all this sensor environment we're, we're putting in is, is just an intriguing future. And finally, uh, looking at space, this really is kind of the uncanny valley, right? We're, we're looking at space ops using virtual reality uh, operations and mission control, so on and so forth, to unify all these assets. It's a big theme with NASA going forward. But if you have assets at different kinds of delays, and delays can be minutes, they can be even longer, more than seconds, how do you represent these assets in a combined view? And uh, we thought about one way is to think about you know things that are yet to 
to happen because there's delay, it may have already happened, but you haven't gotten the information back, is ghosts. So you see different possibilities. Reality can fork depending on what the autonomous system decides to do, and eventually you project it and move forward. You project down to what you know and, and keep extrapolating. This is one of many ways. I have a student now from the ESA uh, in Cologne working with me uh, for the next months trying to think of different ways to represent uncertainty because of delay in these shared mission environments. So that is very much, I think, an uncanny valley. And with that, I'll turn it back to Andrew. Thank you. Great. So one of the topics I think, um, Joe, that you sort of like hinted at, this notion of sort of like ghosts or maybe phantoms or even hallucinations, also something that Peter's very interested in is sort of like the, the invisible. How do we sort of like um, connect with the invisible? Also suggests to me this sort of like strange space um, that we enter when we create these sort of data reconstructions of nature, which are you know, partially intended to be these sort of like eidetic, I don't know, like a replica almost, like a, maybe a replica, not exactly a replica, but maybe like a model. But at the same time, they take on their own kinds of valences and associations and interpretive possibilities. And so this sort of like uh, deer that's sort of, a, you know, maybe not a ghost of something past, but maybe a hallucination of these sorts of combined, um, combined stimuli, it's, we're in a different space. We're sort of in the space of, of fiction or in the space of um, imagination. And that's one of the things I'm very curious about in both of your work uh, is where is that sort of like threshold between almost like data gathering, the sort of like um, diligence and fastidiousness around that and the space of constructing a fiction, the space of constructing an imagination, uh, the, consp the space of constructing possibilities uh, of a future of a future with that data. Where's the space essentially between sort of like um, monitoring and fiction and speculation? Um, well, I think from our introductions, you can see how different the work is that we do. And um, when I appreciated what Peter talked about in terms of invisibility. So, so the uncanny valley, as I understand it from robots, which is the, <laughs> They don't bother us until they get looking like us closely and then freaks us out and then they look exactly like us and we're okay with it. Um, but you know, if that creepy robot was your nanny, maybe it, you would be acclimated and acculturated to it in a way that it would not disturb you. And I think that's the part of um, technology that we're interested in, those things that become invisible. Um, so P Peter's discussion on invisibility is really important. But just to go back to what you're asking about the the kind of sensing, I think um, when for landscape, we tend to take things, um, point sensors, sensors in the field, and extrapolate them into spatial information. There's a huge amount, you could call that a fiction. There's a huge amount of interpretation that goes on there, whether it's weather stations and weather data, um, whether it's rainfall and how we extrapolate that out into floodplains. And these have very real effects in how we actually design and manage our landscapes. Um, so one, um, Jeffrey Morrow wrote a great article on, on weather stations and how so much data interpretation is based on distinguishing between signal and noise. So that's what's interesting about that animal that's <laughs> sort of disintegrating into the environment is like where does the animal begin and where does the environment uh, where does the animal end and environment begin? So I think there's a lot of potential um, in those technologies for, for disturbing our, um, what we understand as animal and environment. That's amazing work. So, um, but I think that when we're looking at how we're trying to understand things like weather patterns and climate change, trying to distinguish between signal and noise is, is breaking down. Um, and we, as I mentioned uncertainty, we actually don't know how to trust uh, some of those interpretations that extrapolate from point data into spatial data. So there's a lot of room for artists and designers to play with that gap um, in different ways. Yeah, I agree with what, what Karen's saying at, at several levels. Um, artists and designers are going to be playing, a, I think, a huge role in bringing all this up into our perception. Uh, you see a little bit of what uh, we heard previously with uh, documentary film. I mean, you know, the footage by itself I mean, is what YouTube presents. It's just moving. And then, of course, somebody can take that and channel it through a documentary and, and present a narrative through it. And uh, that's a bit what we're playing with, with these, what we, we call them avatar landscapes, right? They're landscapes that, that represent the real world, but they're not quite. There's, there's audio here. You can turn it down if you want. 
Uh, this is a, a thing where we had microphones in the real world that would tell into the virtual world. When you were nearby a microphone in the virtual world, you'd hear the real world, but we distorted it so you wouldn't snoop. Whole other area, uh, you know, surveillance and, and how this, this relates. Um, but uh, when we did the animals, um, you know, the, the first rendition that my student Don did of the animals were uh, uh, th those deer you saw in the original video, right? They looked like regular deer. They were an asset in the, the graphics program he just used. Uh, and he could change the colors and stuff. But we want to go further, right? You know, people would ask, is that deer really there? Are you measuring the animal? And you could kind of, you know, fake it. But no, we're not doing that at all. Uh, we're using this as a visualization tool, a way to look at the past. You look at somebody's lawn, it's all brown, they haven't watered it, maybe that's a good thing in time of drought. But, you know, nature has its own way of representing its history through its appearance. So we figured, okay, in the virtual world, can we go further and do that through an apparition and make the apparition such that it, it you know, you can relate to it, it's kind of like an animal. But, you know, its appearance changes drastically in ways that if you know about the program, you can intuitively interpret. So you look at these things, you know how the weather's been or how the conditions have been. You can, again, tilt it to look at different things. Just an, another tool, another way of bringing the data up to people in a way that could be obvious when you're looking at it. Um, but doing it in a way that is a bit poetic. It plays what should be at the landscape, but pushing it into a, a different place. Yeah, I like this. I like this idea of an apparition because it suggests something that somehow emerges from almost almost the data itself. And it strikes me actually that in many of these cases, there's this sort of like um, this struggle for tangibility in this sort of space that we we're trying to understand the behavior more intuitively for. And uh, you know, part of that has to do with you know. To, to go back to um, a topic that Karen alluded to, this notion of signals, right? So all of these sort of um, uh, sort of channels that we're beginning to, to detect and beginning to sort of stitch together constitute signals, but those signals, you know, every signal can be modulated, every signal can be sort of transformed, every signal can be sort of like remixed, as you know, from sort of like um, digital, uh, the digital audio world. And so those also, you know, signals can be corrupted, they can have, um, they can have flaws. And so one of the things that I think is really remarkable about this moment is that nature itself is becoming a kind of signal, nature is becoming a kind of media. And then we begin to sort of like represent and reflect on it in these, um, uh, in these, in these other kinds of ways. And so I'm a little bit curious, kind of like, you know, there are obviously sort of like strong and dominant signals, which obviously are, those are the ones that tend to be sort of like um, most easily communicated. But I'm sure also in your work, you're, you find through this, these kind of like classification processes and some very specific attention that there are some weak signals, some things which are kind of like emergent, which are kind of like not quite at the moment of sort of um, clear, clear apprehension, but that have some significant thing to say actually about this space that you're monitoring. I'm curious about those sort of like weak signals, those sort of like areas of emergence, those sort of like areas of, um, that are somehow like on the threshold of being visible um, that you've encountered recently. Well, so again, if I talk about that question through the work of the environmental modeling lab, um, the signals we're using are spectral signal spectral signatures, so using multispectral cameras for reading things that we can't see uh, with the naked eye. Um, and so, of course, advancements in technology from multispectral to hyperspectral just like gives you more and more so-called fidelity for how we understand and sort our landscapes. Um, so, but I think the, um, there was an image a ways back, I don't know if these are cycling through, that showed um, that we can use the same exact image, but based on how we interpret it um, using different in indexes, that is how we, the formulas for reading the different spectral bands that we get, completely change that understanding of the landscape. I think it's like, yeah, back a ways. Way um, back, okay. Yeah, it's fine. Um, so anyway, it, but it shows, um, you know, if, we, if we're looking for moisture, it completely depends on what a formula you're using to look for moisture. So you can see, see two images that are the same image, just interpreted with a different index, really changes our reading of a landscape, which would really change what you think, where you think water is, and things like that. Um, and so I think um, when you talk about weak signals, there's defi definite ways of uh, interpreting landscape through these different formula, through these different indices that can actually 
uh, demonstrate how one might say fallible some of these maps are and um, how much interpretation goes into that, um, the reading of the landscape. So I think when it comes to our work, it's with the multispectral imagery where we're finding a lot of uh, interesting work can be done. And I imagine the combination of those different signals actually reveals other kinds of insights. I mean, one of the things that I thought was so interesting about um, you know, Peter's work in black holes and that general initiative is that you're sort of like inferring the presence of the black holes through other kinds of information, right? It's like you're not observing that thing directly, you're observing all of its effects and then kind of like reconstituting an entity that would have produced that behavior. And so that's, I think, you know, also a possibility for this kind of like sig signal blending or signal kind of like composition. You're sort of like getting the outline of the apparition or the ghost? I think uh, these days, too, with uh, the rise of, of, of AI, you've got lots of different ways to go at data and, and come out with, with things you really didn't know were necessarily there. Um, we uh, uh, have a lot of data. We've stored almost everything for at least five, six years at Tim Marsh, including audio, continuous audio capture. Um, and we went back and mined it a couple of years ago for uh, signatures of different species, when they come, when they go. And that's kind of intriguing. For cicadas, uh, I could see a brood clearly coming out that was much bigger than the previous year. So, you know, the signal is there. We didn't know if you listen to it, but if you go back and use the right tools, you'll, you'll see this. We can see species coming and going at different times, different parts of the year. And these could have other implications for what's happening to the environment on a grander scale. Um, but yeah, these these signals are being captured, and there's increasingly new and better ways to start going in and uncovering some of these these hidden factors that could be in there. Yeah, and I think what it's I think it's appropriate that you sort of mention this question of AI because I think we're also at a moment when uh, sort of categories or understandings of intelligence are expanding, not only through artificial intelligence but also our expanding under understanding or of human intelligence or even sort of like plant communication, for example. I mean, like, for example, when, you know, elephants and dolphins have names for each other, then the sort of like sin qua non of human intelligence, this idea of language, is something that's not, not quite so precious. And so I'm a little bit curious, actually, so to, as you're engaging with these kinds of, um, with these kinds of processes, has, has your kind of like understanding of human intelligence in relationship to these other potential kinds of intelligence has changed? Or, is, uh, or how also do notions of intelligence or intelligibility sort of influence your work? That's one of the deep questions of our time in so many ways. I mean, how do these systems enhance us and, and don't just tunnel us into some expectation, which is the other problem? Um, and yeah, in, in interpreting data, I have a lot of these visualizations, you can actually tilt it so you can kind of s encourage people to see something that you, you want them to see through a, a metaphor that could be a powerful one. And we show the animals, but there could be other things coming out of the image. Uh, but I think the big issue is, where does the, what does the machine interpret, what does the human interpret, and how does that move back and forth? Simple visualization, sonification, you have tools, but you're giving the human the ability to go through and come up with conclusions and, and search the data and find something. If you're just doing machine learning, you're running the data through and you're getting a graph, and yet you can interpret the graph or you're getting a result, maybe you can interpret it to some level, but you're pushing the onus more onto the algorithms that are running on the machine. Of course, people are involved in putting those together often. With machine learning, or deep AI, it's, it's more of a black box. But yeah, that, that's a boundary that's a fluid one and I think a really critical one. Um, so machine learning has been used in land cover interpretation for decades, not the kind of uh, deep learning or neural network that's recent. That has not been widely apl applied. It's only a matter of time. Um, and so obviously there's a lot of great things that can be done with this technology, but also when you consider how this is extrapolated to global, I like to use the example of forest because it's an obvious one, um, how we're interpreting landscapes. We often think of Fidelity is, is a problem of resolution. Um, it's actually not, I mean, it can be, but you know, research shows that the same image just interpreted using a different definition um, of what a forest is. Every country has a definition of what a forest is because obviously we need different definitions because our, we have such different geographic environments. But we don't know how some of our uh, land cover data is being interpreted using what definition. So you can have, the, again, the exact same image. And if you say forest is 10% area covered with trees versus 30%, you're going to get a radically different image. 
And we can say, oh, that's interesting. But when it becomes problematic is when these are being used for things like the Red Plus program by the UN for forest accounting. So for me, classification becomes an issue when it starts accounting for nature in this kind of global sense, which can erase a lot of local differences. Um, and it's, it's not even how countries define forests, but even just like where you set, for reading imagery, where you set your reference there around a pixel, is this a, a tree, is it not a tree? Depending on how that moves or how big that is, um, one study found that um, the amount of what's determined forest could vary by as much as 50%. So if you're a country that's applying to receive carbon credits for us being allowed to spew out carbon while they have to keep their forest, that's like a huge monetary difference. Um, so I think that, again, being able to show um, how much interpretation goes into this Im imagery making is incredibly important for people to see. Yeah, and I think this question of classification also, you know, obviously it gets to the heart of sort of like intelligibility and sort of machine and hu human intelligence. It also, I think, relates to this sort of idea of dynamism that um, that Peter mentions. You know, we're in a world where we're trying to come to terms with some very fast moving kinds of challenges. And so the portraits that we're making of the, that world are necessarily dynamic. And so I think it raises this question of like, okay, in this sort of like categorization, in this sort of like tax, in these sort of taxonomies, um, in these sort of catalogs that we've had of nature, you know, are, are we at a moment where we need to think about those a little bit more dynamically. Are, you know, I was, we've been involved with a project that's um, about aridification in the American West and the sort of uh, actual change in migration in these sort of like eco regions. Like the EPA has this sort of like set of classifications of different sort of like territory that are bound together in sort of like um, almost like these microecologies. Those things change over time. Their definition is not, it's, it's much more slippery than one would like. And so I think that's one of the things I'm very curious about is like how do we deal with these sort of like dynamic situations in a way which is kind of like operative and effective, but that takes account for those kind of like slippery categorizations. And how do we do that in sort of like a, uh, in a robust way? I, I want to think about it a little bit. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to go or? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I guess I have to go. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I think there could be multiple ways, uh, the way a scientist would do it, right? There are multiple ways to look at the data. There are tools you can use to try to validate it. There are different opinions that can come through uh, and be represented in the data. I mean, I, I, I myself was a physicist, as Peter was, and uh, we used to have multiple analysis chains that would work on the same data and the multiple experiments at the same collider looking at the same thing. And we'd have to, within a group, converge the analysis chains. And then you know, you'd all present your result. And if the other groups didn't see the result, you know, maybe you made a breakthrough, maybe you didn't, but there would be a scientific debate. Yeah, it becomes a kind of collective intelligence as opposed it, to sort of like a unitary works that thing. Way. Yeah. It does. And I think uh, when we present data to people, of course, then you, know, you can start getting different kinds of propaganda and trying to sway opinion in a more basic level, we see that all the time. But uh, ideally, giving people enough insight into the data, some sort of idea of who it is that's presenting this inter interpretation to you, these are all critical. I mean, it's, it's a, another battle for reality, right? But now done at the level of the actual information we're seeing, and we have everywhere augmented reality, we'll be, we'll, we'll be dealing with this with physical perception itself. I mean, this, this could go very deep in, in many different ways. Yeah, and I think I think there's this, and maybe I'll sort of like tee up some uh, some comments. I think there's a really interesting way in which all of the kinds of methods that we're talking about are they're inherently collective. I mean, they're collective in the sense that we're collecting a lot of data and we're looking at sort of like very large scales and territories. But at the same time, we're drawing on expertise of a whole range of different, um, you know, ways of understanding that environment and those. Contested definitions actually emerge from a conversation among many, many different perspectives, and so there's there's an inherently collective kind of understanding uh, of I think real time nature that w that you are, are both sort of like manifesting in your work, but I think is going to become more and more essential as we move forward. Just to go back to your word dyna dynamic, um, which is an incredibly important one, especially for landscapes. Um, I think the challenge is how we've understood our environments and landscapes is through what's called stationarity. So we understand that they are dynamic, but we assume they're so from within a certain uh, 
like in a little box. So drought equals this, flood equals this, and everything in between. Now we know stationarity is not really a great way to understand what's happening, especially with rapid climate change. And that's, we actually don't have good ways of, of dealing with that or working with that when it comes to things like building our infrastructure. So I think these tools have, are providing just amazing insight, bioacoustics, just um, these time-based media are giving us different kind of access to these worlds, to these other worlds um, in amazing ways. Um, but when it comes to um, things like how do we adapt to climate, how do, where should people live, where do they move, we actually, we're not doing a very good job of that, of understanding that, um, because it's incredibly difficult to um, have a frame that, um, for knowing what's going to happen under such high levels of uncertainty. So again, making um, that evident to people, it, there's a lot of interesting studies about how people feel about floods and flood mapping. Um, and whether showing a gradient, um, whether showing the ambiguity is, is kind of psychologically positive or negative, and it honestly depends on what experience people have had with floods or not. Um, so our, our, the FEMA flood modeling maps right now are going towards more and more gradients, more and more specificity, because the data we have on topography is more refined, more and more accurate. But topography is the only thing you can make more accurate in how flood modeling works. So it's actually having the opposite effect. It's actually removing people from the floodplain by saying they don't need flood insurance when, in fact, um, that's probably not what's going to happen. So there, we still um, are having difficulty trying to <laughs> square what we know about the variability of our environment with um, how we build. It's a huge challenge. But again, opportunity for designers and artists and uh, landscape architects to actually show uh, the variability of our, our images, of our models, um, so people can understand it. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a great point. I mean, we, we sort of began the discussion thinking about fictions, and that's a specific way in which designers can engage some of these questions. And I think there's, I don't think it's any sort of coincidence that we've seen a rise in both design fictions and these sort of like solar punk kind of like imaginings of uh, potential futures. But there's also this sort of like media design aspect of things, uh, which I think is, uh, which is really interesting because it gets to this question of kind of like a, the sensorium. What is the human sensorium? I mean, we have these five senses. Maybe there are six, seven. I think there's some these kinesthetic sense. There's other sorts of ideas about what augmented senses might be. But what we're trying to communicate is something that eludes many of those senses. And um, you know, I, I think you know that's something obviously that I think both of you are trying to engage in some ways. Like, how do you kind of like. Um, how do you hack or augment or sort of otherwise, um, you know, wire our senses into this kind of um, this kind of understanding when you know obviously we're not sort of like built for it? And so I'm curious about that process of sort of like sensory augmentation. Then on the horizon, this sort of like question of kind of like how other entities might might sense. I think this this idea of kind of like non-human sensoria is something also that anyway we'll return to. But I'm curious, how do we sort of like yeah, get our senses to the point where we can begin to intuitively apprehend this incredible complexity. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great question, one that we love. Uh, you know, expand our umwelt in in some way. I mean, it's a, it's a great idea. Um, you know, we are stuck with what we have, although we can interpret our senses in different ways, right? With different levels of sophistication, some things you can maybe plasticize and get a feel for if you live with it. You know, we work a lot now with haptics and other things. I have a student that's really kind of specializing in, in this now for control problems and things like this, giving you a feeling for, you know, an AI's intent or who knows what, some other thing that's not physical, but bring it into some manifestation. Um, but quite often these things are just hassles and you'll take it off because you just don't want it. The, the distraction of this expanded environment that tends to be something that just irritates you. Get it to the point where it really works, where it's giving you that kind of information. Uh, sonification is intriguing for us too because that if you're looking at something, your eyes are just focused on it. You get a lot of parallel information. It takes immediate attention. Um, but you can also have background things going through audio, especially, right? Where you can actually hear uh, how something is evolving and you can recognize a certain uh, timbre or a certain kind of a tonal quality or, or it could even be a melody. Who knows what it is, right? So that's kind of intriguing to think about your eyes and your ears and putting them both where they're kind of optimal when you're looking at data and reviewing it. 
uh, even ambient media, right? We can connect to a landscape like we did with Tipmarsh. People are doing it with video all the time, right? There's all landscapes all over the world now. Suddenly you can look in real time kind of anywhere to these amazing places uh, and you hear the audio from it. But can I take that audio and then turn it, or these sensors, and turn it into something that's a, a piece of music that I enjoy, but it has the flavor of the place that it's tied to. This is just intriguing for us, and sound artists have looked at this for, for decades, but now we can kick this up to a scale that we've never seen before, because there's so much of it, so many tools to put this together into some sort of an aesthetic. Uh, it's, it's kind of intriguing at that level, functional and, and aesthetic, both. And they can come together, but when they're separate already, it's, it's just fascinating. So we're not working with uh, sensors in that particular way. I, I do think there's um, a lot of interesting examples of how we can tap into the senses of others, even though we don't. We know that we can't really embody what it's like to be a shrimp. Um, but Karen Bacher's book, Sounds of Life, is really great, and also um, Gaia's Web, which is coming out. Um, just came out, um, offer amazing examples of what bioacoustics and all of these tools, listening to nature, listening after nature, um, provide us. Um, so there's no question this is changing our sensibility about what's going on in things we can't see with our eyes. So I think there's lots of potential there. And I always have a but, <laughs> but the, uh, you know, the DARPA, the Military PALS program, Persistent Aquatic Living Sensors, are also using those uh, shrimp and grouper signals to try to learn from those signals to understand when there's like underwater foreign craft. So um, there's always, you know, nefarious purposes, often why these technologies are developed, developed in the first place, but as Peter shows, you put those in the hands of someone else and you can tell completely different stories and different things. So you can be listening, you know, with empathy or for pain or listen for very different reasons. So I think, again, there's a lot of really great positive work being done. Yeah, I think that's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, very quickly, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the work of the composer David Dunn. Uh, he does amazing work where he puts sensors into trees to pick up you know, insects that are eating in the tree. For instance, uh, he puts sensors underwater, microphones all over a landscape, but he'll do a composition with it that will go on for an hour. We have an insight to a space, which is either stuff you cannot perceive, but you suddenly hear, I don't want to call it a symphony, but a whole you know, structure that evolves over a day, which is you know, these, these things eating the leaves in a tree or wood borers, whatever they are. Uh, or you hear, a landscape like a lake in California, like you've never heard it before, because he's got these microphones and he's mix. He's not just bringing them up, he's mixing them actively to give you a portrait of this place, which is not what you would get with your eyes and ears. I mean, it's, it's just fascinating what a great artist can do, just with the signals, either the ones we normally perceive, use them in a different way, or the ones we don't perceive. And he's a great example. Yeah, it, it reminds me actually a little bit as I was researching for this conversation, um, I ran across, across the fact that Alexander Graham Bell, after his work on the telephone, he created a, a photophone. And the photophone was also intended to sort of like transmit voice or sound um, over long distances, uh, but it did it purely through light. And so it was possible to transmit, you know, this sort of like signal during a sort of like clear day, but even on a cloudy day, you would begin to hear that, um, that ambient sound. And so let's see, he, there was this amazing quote that he, um, he, he wrote his father and he says, I've heard the articulate speech of sunlight. I've heard a ray of the sun laugh and cough and sing. Uh, I've been able to hear a shadow and I've, been, uh, I've even perceived by ear the passage of a cloud across the sun's disk. It's just like something incredibly poetic about that. Um, you know, at the same time, it's like there could be a process of misreading, of mishearing. And of course, this is, I think, also a very interesting space um, uh, for design. So I, I want to sort of like maybe shift gears slightly and um, what, when are we supposed to wind up? Okay, good. Okay, good. So uh, the, we sort of like alluded maybe tangentially to this idea of interspecies communication. And speaking of sort of like underwater creatures, I'm reminded of this, um, this anecdote of um, animal, animal Farm. So Animal Farm, many of you may be familiar with. There's this sort of like experimental architecture collective from the 70s, this project called the Dolphin Embassy where they were trying to communicate with dolphins. And they got a grant actually from California to, to 
to build some device that was supposed to communicate with whales. And so there was this media event where they got, you know, many of the sort of like local news channels and Jerry Brown, then the governor of California, um, who we also saw previously in the presentation, was going to come to this, I think it was like Point Reyes, somewhere in the Bay Area, and, um, and sort of use this device. And so one of the reporters was like, oh, I hear Jerry Brown is going to talk to dolphins today. And... Um, uh, the guys from Anthem were not like, no, the dolphins are going to talk to him. And so that's one kind of like interesting reversal of this moment, the kind of like post-human reversal where, you know, we're no longer sort of like putting our, you know, putting the anthropocentric signals out there, but we're trying to understand what's being, what's being told to us and um, trying to listen a little bit more fully, uh, more fully to that. So I'm a little bit curious, those sort of like moments where, uh, those entities sort of, you know, uh, ascension or not, are beginning to sort of like tell us things. There are some moments where we begin to, where, where you and your work have begun to sort of like uncover insights where, oh, there is a signal, there's something that's being told to me. I think it's, it's fascinating. Um, it, it's a different game. I mean, people have been trying to communicate with uh, marine mammals for sure. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, birds of various sorts, things like this, uh, primates over the years. Uh, but are they really telling us what they would normally say? I mean, the umwelt of one of these animals, uh, mammal may be closer, marine mammal quite a bit different. <laughs> Not entirely sure that we're prepared, prepared to even understand what they're saying without a little bit of poetry in between, right? Uh, we're living, though, in this world of, you know, AIs that... Uh, Basically, uh, we're, we're entering it. We're not living in it. We're entering it. We're made, and that's what a lot of this research is about now, where they're trying to interpret the signals, use some sort of a ground truth, and have the AI represented to us in, in a narrative of some sort. And, uh, you know, exactly what did they say? Is it, you know, the, the water is warm over there, my friends are on the other side, it's good to be with family? I, I don't know. Uh, but I think the way it comes isn't going to be necessarily a, a simple one-to-one -one mapping. It's going to be a more complicated one because you're talking about different intelligence, a different reality in some cases too. Yeah, and I think the sort of like space of the umwelt, the sort of like this construct of worlds, it's like it's a super critical construct. It's like what are the what is the sort of world that we understand? What are the layers of worlds that we understand? And then what are the worlds that sort of like intersect with that out in this sort of like larger larger cosmos? Very open question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, considering the, how science is using these technologies to learn more, so I don't think we can know what it's telling us exactly. We, we you know, intuit behavior, even bef obviously <laughs> science and naturalists have been intuiting behavior for hundreds of years. So we, we're learning about different behaviors now with these technologies. Um, I don't think we can embody what these critters are. Um, <laughs> But um, I think the, what I, there was a video, I don't know if any, how many people are familiar with the Y2Y project, Yellowstone to Yukon, which is a huge um, multi, well, crossing the United States and Canada um, conservation project for large mammals. Um, and it was inspired by uh, tracking a wolf. Uh, you know, so of course we've been doing animal tracking for a very long time, but uh, that's it's much more continuous now with GPS. Um, and watching um, GPS sensors of birds flying, migrating globally are amazing visualizations. They're incredibly beautiful. Um, they bring out the dynamic nature of this life. Um, but what, there was a very powerful bit video, Bear 71, that was a, um, could track, the, track a bear. It showed um, everything about this environment where the bear was crossing. We could see its movement across the landscape. But it was paired with the video of what it what happens to the bear when we track it um, and just seeing this massive animal um, being like shot and tranquilized and it, it was just a really powerful juxtaposition of like the project of course is to help these animals but we also look at what 
what about the individual animal? And to me, that's very powerful work that shows um, why we think the science is important, wh how it changes conservation practices, um, but there's also the individual animal. And um, a former colleague of uh, mine and Daniel's, Etienne Benson, wrote an excellent book on the minimal animal. Um, it's called The Minimal Animal, which is about animal tracking. He was looking at squirrels, but it's uh, so very tangled and interesting sets of relationships. We, we actually, uh, this can happen at different levels too. We, we had a project in talking about landscapes where uh, we worked with a Thai real estate company, MQDC, you probably know them. Uh, they were doing a set of developments where people would be living in what you best call an urban forest outside of Bangkok. Uh, they really tried to make it like a forest, but of course it was, it was really a real estate development was tame, but it was you know, nature with people. And they wanted the forest to communicate with the people that lived there somehow. And people that were remote, ideally to make uh, for happiness. It's a big thing in Thailand is to you know, get happiness from things. And that's, that's a little scary. But anyway, we, we thought it was kind of interesting to have the forest talk to you. So uh, you know, we put sensors out. We worked with Patty Maz's group, uh, Pat Panataborn and some of the colleagues there. And we actually built a chat, he called it a chat GP tree, where the sensor data was trained on what a forest would, would say, basically we was, it was, it's dry, it's wet, temperature, people around, whatever it is, right? Uh, sounds of animals. And it, you could ask and query the forest, it would talk to you about its situation, you know, how it felt. Uh, and there's a future there. Of course, you know, how close is that to reality? But you, know, you start building models of an ecosystem uh, which can do it. Actually, uh, uh, Catherine D'Ignazio did a, a thing called the Babbling Brook many years ago. She's now a professor at Dusp at MIT. Uh, first time I've ever seen this, she had, we, it was a project class that I taught with Sheila Kennedy, where we put sensors out in, she put sensors out in a brook that was overflowing in her backyard. And it was gonna, if it was going to flood, it would tweet wisecrack. So you could ask the brook things, but it would tweet to you, tweet its condition. This is already like 15 years ago. You know, you, now everything tweets, but back then nothing did. Her brook did. So uh, it's intriguing to have these non-intelligent, even you can even talk about it being a single organism, but it can start to have an identity and start to have a narrative around it that you can engage with. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like we're somehow like lim we're reaching the limits of Anthro anthropic sort of like cognition and we're trying to we're like struggling for ways to make these things which we know we need to engage with productively kind of legible and and operative and so those are some really interesting ways to try and I don't know decode and recode some of those actions which you know on some level they feel like contortions but on other on another level it's like it's a way to just maybe it's a way to make those things legible maybe it's not such a terrible misinterpretation. Maybe it's just something that allows us to engage with those things more productively. Um, in the latest issue of LA Plus Botanic, Ursula Heiser wrote a great piece on changing representations of plants in fiction. So like Little Shop of Horrors, you know, <laughs> plants are coming out of people or destroying people um, and how it's sort of changed to where um, plants have become central characters like sentient beings. And of course that changes our perception of plants um, and our relationship to them. So I think these technologies do offer a different sort of empathy, or that's what they're trying to do, is build empathy in a different way. We don't know what long-term that might mean or what it might look like, but I think um, that's what a lot of this work is trying to do. Um, it really shifts our perception interpretation. Yeah, it's interesting. So some of the very early work around sensory ecology um, was developed by one of sort of like Darwin's um, uh, Darwin's disciples, and basically he had this sort of like chart which um, tried to anatomize the, of course, like human senses, but then senses uh, that animals might have, but also kind of like almost like behaviors or uh, kind of like ethical senses that they that they might have. Are they feeling pain or are they feeling empathy, right? And I think what we're trying to do as we sort of like encounter this world is expand not only our sort of like sensory ecology, but our sort of like emotional ecology somehow. We're trying to empathize in new and different kinds of ways with things that we've never empathized with before. I think that's an enormous shift, I would say. Um, so I want to get back to this um, this question of sort of like, which has been sort of, we've been dancing around with this question of scale and this question of sort of like 
close and distant readings. So, um, you know, in particular in, you know, in data science, sometimes there's this, there's this idea of the distant reading where you're sort of like taking a step back and Franco Moretti, I think, sort of like popularized this. You're taking a step back and you're sort of like seeing the forest um, in totality. Um, and then, of course, there's a close reading from, that we know from art history, which is very kind of like a meticulous attention to a very uh, specific kind of, a very specific entity. I think what's interesting is now we're in this space where the close and distant reading are somehow like confounded and reciprocal and entangled. It's like, you know, when we're sensing at the environmental level, it matters actually what is happening at the entity level, and we can understand what's happening at the entity level. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm curious in your own work how you kind of like think about that sort of like distant versus close reading, the sort of like threshold between the two, when those become connected, when they actually create a kind of like feedback cycle. You know, what do, what do those actually mean for the process of, you know, eco design, I guess? Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. This kind of local global is not a binary, um, and it's not even a, a a gradient or scalar. It's totally simultaneous. It's like a process, a risk. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I talked about spectral signatures uh, in reading Earth observation imagery, but those spectral libraries that house the wavelengths were all taken like with in-field samples. So the, they were taken in very specific locations by scientists with a particular question. They measure the wavelengths of that plant leaf uh, at a, within 48 hours of being plucked and then stick it in the spectral library. And that library then um, becomes used um, to interpret landscapes other than where it was taken. So it, it, it's just, uh, again, it's just another point of how we are understanding like something local. The question might begin local, but then we're applying it to, to other contexts. So, I don't, I don't think that, did that answer? Did you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this, I, I mean, I'm actually very curious about this sort of like spectral data set Spect because the spectral data set, I mean, this question of kind of like what the relationship between the, the large scale and the small scale, the sort of like distant yeah. reading and close reading, yeah. this spectral data set tries to cr maybe create a little bit of that, but in a very, you know, maybe noisy way. Yeah, so we're reading all of these sort of global images or, or aerial images, but the how we're reading them is through wavelengths that were taken kind of from in the field. Yeah, and very controlled conditions. Yeah. They're like lab <laughs> samples in a way, and that yeah, extrapolation, lab samples, yeah. Yeah, extrapolation can be tricky. Yeah, yeah I, I agree here. It's, it's really a sampling problem at a certain level. Uh, we thought about it a lot at Tim Marsh, where we could zoom, right? You zoom out in the virtual world, you see all the stuff. We have discrete sensors at points. You're seeing the point light data. Uh, but then as you zoom in, you can zoom into a sensor, sure. But what about if you zoom in in between, right, into a patch of ground that isn't measured? Could we start to represent that uh, in different ways? And then you get into uh, producing a fiction that's based on what you know, which may not be exactly true, right? So you could, and you could say something about the CO2 levels, maybe the, uh, we have a whole video about that, a student looked at, at that kind of thing. But her model was very sparse. I don't think it was accurate, but it could give you the impression it was, which is a little bit dangerous. We love the idea of zooming even further. You can zoom into wormholes. So there are certain areas where you can go deeper, where we do have a sensor. You can go to a tree, right? There are insects eating the log. You can hear them, because we, we have sensors in it. You you can go to the pond where we have a microscope. We never did it, but we actually were on the threshold of putting a video microscope into the pond where you could actually see little microbes maybe swimming through. Um, so yeah, there are areas where you could. There are other areas we'd have to use a model to interpret, and, and the fidelity of that depends on the actual model. And then we use drones. Actually, in 2015, we actually, in the game engine we used to drive the VR representation, you could drive a real drone on Tidmarsh. It was not easy to do back then. Uh, but uh, you could look through the drone, look through the model, have the drone superimposed on the model. We tried to play with this whole idea of dynamically changing your location, both with a sensor suite and in terms of taking all the data you've got and melding that with this dynamic asset. So, you know, the whole idea of location is getting blurred at a few levels. Uh, there's a lot more that can be done. Just to go back to the, the tidal marshes we're monitoring, um, you know, with the drone imagery, you're taking a certain area, you're taking spectral samples in the field of the vegetation you're looking for, but then you're taking 
uh, those and reading larger satellite images with the spectral data you've collected as a way to map much larger areas than what you can do with the drone. So again, it's like local sample to low altitude drone to satellite are all conspiring to give us um, what we think is the best representation of the condition of the wetlands so we can track how that vegetation is changing. We talk a lot about doing that on, the, on, on planetary objects as well, right? Uh, we developing a sensor net for the moon now, uh, and the whole idea is you have a rover. Rover can move, right? So you can sense different places. But if you want to go up into rock pile, a place you can't go, you can ballistically shoot a sensor out, and it can land there, and it can take measurements you know, somewhere the rover can't go. So you can expand your whole horizon of, of sensory input to places that aren't really accessible. And then, of course, you have orbiting assets that, that image on, on, on the moon, too. You combine all of that. And again, figure out where the rover should go, where it should be taking its samples with its launch sensors and things like that. Very curious about these ballistic sensors, but I think I might. this might be a signal. The conversation short right now, but I think we'd like to open up the conversation to the rest of the audience. Oh, yeah, please, pose yeah. any questions to our panelists. I think Annie has the mics over there. I can pass them out to you guys. Thanks so much for a really wonderful panel. I would love to follow up on this question of uncertainty and representation. Obviously, it's incapable, or we are incapable, it's not possible to represent all of the complexities of what's going on. How in your work and what you've seen of other people's work, is there a way, an approach that you respect of acknowledging those uncertainties that are involved in how data is collected, interpreted, and then represented in a way that engenders engagement with the work rather than more strictly kind of fear, anxiety, et cetera? Um, that point about not in <laughs> stoking fear and anxiety is a hard one. Um, so if you look at, say, the IPCC reports on climate, they talk about the level of uncertainty and like when will we reach this threshold of warming. And they say, we're 80% sure, we're 90% sure. When you're talking about something that's sort of open, I think that doesn't, I mean, besides climate anxiety causing us immense, immense amount of pain, it, those reports um, talking about that level of uncertainty, I think is understandable uh, for people in an easier way than when you're talking about uncertainty, for example, when, as I mentioned earlier, kind of mapping our floodplains um, with understanding like where rainfall is going to go, where we're, um, how we're going to move people or build our infrastructure. And unfortunately, the timelines through which we build, through which things are funded, are not long enough um, for us to really think broad and bold. So um, our infrastructural plan is all building infrastructure that's going to be out of date um, because it's built on kind of old models. So, so to answer your question about um, uncertainty, I do think it's very important to be um, forth coming about our best laid plans as landscape architects. You know, you, we work among private entities, public entities, governments, and we like to present things, and here's our design, and we're sure this is going to be beautiful, and, and it will work, but I think we're at a point now where um, it's just more helpful to um, work through the various scenarios underlying our assumptions in terms of the time frames we're looking at and all the variable conditions that, um, which is that you're trying to steer towards certain trajectories. We don't know what the end point's gonna be. And that's an incredibly challenging problem when you're thinking about infrastructure. Yeah, in uh, most of what we do where we try to present a conclusion, we have error bars typically, right? So you have a plot and you have some sort of assumption what the error is and you show it physically on that representation. If you look at a virtual world, it's a little harder to do that. Um, one thing we thought about would be sliders, right? Where you could look at a range of assumptions that are possible within this model and you can explore yourself. It may be a most likely, but you can actually push it back and forth and see. Um, the uh, other thing of disclaimers, and the, uh, the person that, that did this really nice thesis uh, with carbon models and our sensors of Tib Marsh and a great visualization, yeah, I was uncomfortable with it because people would have the impression that you know, we're really measuring this to some degree of accuracy. I had her put a disclaimer in there. 
So in her thesis, that you know, this is using sparse data that probably doesn't really reflect what's really happening. Gives a rough idea, but we're not going to stand by this at all. This is just to show what's possible. So uh, I think all these levels, it's important, at least in the academic community, as we go forward. Uh, is this a piece of art for aesthetic? Is this saying something that you want to get an interpretation out of? In which case, you know, put the boundaries on it. Or if it's quantitative data, be really clear about the error, the way we all have to be. I mean, I think it's really interesting also to think about the distinction between uncertainty as in kind of like engineering error of measurement and uncertainty of application for the data, right? Because I think when data is produced, it's often produced with a specific sort of like intention for its, for its use. Uh, but I think one of the things that's been kind of, you know, remarkable and difficult and scary and amazing about um, the sort of like deep learning revolution is that a lot of that data has been been misused, at least according to its original intention, right? I mean, the whole of the internet's text was never intended to be used to train these very large models. And so that's a kind of like very, you know, challenging space. It's like, how do we sort of like anticipate the uses of data, guard against the ones that we have some reservation about, but enable the ones which, um, which we hope for and which we may not anticipate, but which may align with our sort of values. And I think it's, it's, a, very, it's a very challenging thing. And one other way, um, I wouldn't say this, we're explicitly dealing with uncertainty, but a lot of the work we're doing right now is um, monitoring, uh, meaning that the Army Corps has a bunch of sediment. Instead of dumping in a landfill, they're like, where should we put it? We want to build up some marsh habitat for birds. Um, you, you, you're making best guesses, um, and then it's basically an, a multi-year experiment. So you put it there, you monitor it, things move around. So there isn't the expectation that you have the answer. It's actually much more dynamic as a process. We're living in the experiment. Yeah. <laughs> and, and wetlands are intriguing because they absorb a lot of CO2 when they work. Not all of them do. Some of them emit CO2. And the actual mechanism by which this happens and how you can structure a wetland when you're restoring to do it, it's not that well understood. We've worked a lot with collaborators. And, you know, and they would put sensors in that would be more accurate than ours, but to a certain specific location, whereas we went for the broad measurement. But they were able to use our data as well, which was, was nice. I think it's my turn. Um, thanks so much. Such a such a rich conversation, and and I think some issues, of course, that will uh, play out over the day. And uh, you know, in particular, just this kind of last bit. Um, I think around the question of sort of use and misuse, and critical or or commercial misuse, and how we begin to think about the relationship of art and design and other sorts of cultural practices relative to these you know, military and carceral technologies, basically, right, as, as noted. But I wanted to ask a, a, a kind of annoying, I think it's annoying, it's, it's annoying to me, I'm annoyed by it, but hopefully maybe you'll embrace it, but, um, and, and, you know, this, this kind of cycle of the uncanny valley, uh, which is to say, do we have the tech, this is, there's a, there's a kind of conundrum in here, right, do we have the tech to understand the carbon accounting of the tech, uh, right? I mean, which is to say, all, uh, how, all of this sensing has a cost, right? Uh, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm still sort of floored by the reopening of Three Mile Island by Microsoft to power their AI, et cetera. Is there a way that we begin to, to um, think pretty carefully about sort of what we need, how much we need, when we need it relative to these carbon emissive costs? Or does that even enter into any of the equations that are going on in your, in your teams and your research? Um. The tech for accounting for carbon, are, do you mean carbon removal or just all carbon budget, including like forests? I just mean that the technologies that we're using, yeah. sensing and AI, emit carbon, right? I mean, in most. In, no, the answer is no. You, you don't have the tech to monitor <laughs> no, the tech. Yeah. Cor well, <laughs> yeah, um, I would say the answer is no, because of the, uh, at certain scales, of course, we have the tech. We can sequester in the ground. There's lots of things we know we need to do, wetlands and protecting them, all sorts of things for storing carbon. But in terms of trying to account for how much our landscapes can hold carbon, we do not have. Sorry, I, I'm actually asking if you're if you're taking um, one of the sensing projects that you're using to understand the the health of the wetlands and its yeah. various characteristics. Those sensing devices and their computational uh, ramifications are 
carbon hungry, let's say, right? And, and we could talk about the electrification of the grid and, and yeah. da, 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 we could do all that. But I'm just curious about if there's a, a almost, it's almost a kind of like speed governor, right? I mean, is there a capacity to understand um, how this amazing kind of explosion of knowledge around knowing the world so much more carefully and clearly and with very specific intent, you know, also has costs, right? And, and has kind of, I mean, winners and losers, so to speak. Yeah, okay, so the embodied carbon of the technologies we're using and where we're extracting and all of that. Yeah, no, I mean, we probably don't have a very accurate picture of those. We call these sensors cheap. They're cheap on the buying end of them, not on the producing end. I think uh, you, you hit on something that, that has a lot of pieces you can untangle. I mean, people say something is sustainable. I've done lots of projects. People have been on thesis committees. People are in sustainability. Okay, you're looking at a certain horizon, but what does it cost to make this, to manufacture it? Do you account that and bring that in? I mean, there are so many levels. It's very complicated. I think if you look at the kinds of sensors that we use, at least for our terrestrial applications, um, they're pretty minor. They can harvest energy. We do a lot of energy harvesting stuff. Power is minimal. You don't really have to replace batteries, at least depending on what the sensor is. Uh, compared to what we use in smart homes, it's nothing. So I think it's just a level of scale. Uh, if you launch a, a satellite, okay, there's some environmental cost in that, but you look at the benefit you're getting from the satellite, it's enormous uh, in, in terms of helping the environment too. We saw great examples in Peter's talk. Um, so you can argue that. AI, whole other story there, because you've got massive data servers. There's such a demand for this, and an increasing demand. You're going to have more of them. Certainly, we're, there's Denard scaling. We work really hard at pushing power required by these GPUs and, and huge farms down. But you know the demand is just huge. So what do we do to mitigate the energy cost of computation? That's not just about analyzing the data from environments. It's about our life. Uh, and that's a big deal. We put them near you know, hydroelectric things. Eventually, we'll have safe nuclear of some sort. We'll have fusion. But I'm being a techno-optimist here. I mean, we've got to deal with the problem now, so we have to find efficient ways of doing this computation and, and not just keep sucking the power grid down. I think there's a sort of like question behind the question, which is how do we as designers draw the boundary around a system and begin to understand how that system really behaves and what the intended and maybe unintended consequences of that might be. And I feel like that's actually one of the critical design questions of our time. It's just like, how do we begin to draw those boundaries? Because I think whether we like it or not, the, the carbon crisis that we find ourselves in is probably the first, or maybe not the first, but one of the more, more acute of a series of cascading environmental issues that we will be confronting over the next century, right? You know, there'll be a PFAS cleanup. There'll be all, you know, a whole range of other sorts of crises. For every one of those, there's a different system boundary, a different dynamic, a different accounting, different unintended consequences. And this question of kind of like how we design for the contingency of unintended consequences, it's a blank area in design. Nobody talks about it. It's like, it's, it's a void, right? And I think this is one of the things that, as responsible designers, we have to begin to ask is like, okay, well, as we centrifugally move out from the thing that we think we're designing, what are all of the other things that this impacts? And how do we begin to sort of like think about where things could go, where things would, could go wrong? I mean, how do we like candidly ask ourselves that? It's, it's something that's, I think, super fundamental to, to our time, something that we have to take responsibility for on some level. Hi, um, thank you for the wonderful discussion. Um, just following up on two things, the idea of uncertainty and contingency. If you were to remove it from the idea of risk and start looking at un uncertainty as a way, um, to, as a, the potential of uncertainty for change, um, I would like to hear your thoughts on that. So the potential of uncertainty for change, can you unpack that a little bit, actually? Sorry. Um, so I'm thinking of uncertainty as, um, as a way, if you look at it through climate or technology, um, how an uncertainty can allow a space for a newer imagination. Right? So I'm looking at, so want to remove it from the idea of risk for a moment and think of it as a potential. 
So because you don't know what would happen, many things are possible and uh, kind of embrace that in that, okay, this is adding a richness that if you know for sure what's gonna happen, you know, the, the, this, this asteroid is gonna hit the earth, and we know it to 99.99%, we're, you know, we kind of know, uh, but uh, climate change, okay, people argue about it, it's certain, we, we know it's happening, we know it's gonna have deep effect, but we don't know exactly what they would be and when they're gonna roll out, right? That, that's fuzzy. Um, I don't know if I'd embrace that. The call for action is, people tend to you know, use uncertainty as an excuse not to do anything, which is the wrong thing, right? All the uncertainties that are there and something like this are not pointing in the right direction for the most part. So uh, yeah, we, we have to think of what to do, but because there's uncertainty, we don't exactly know which would be the most important, what to mitigate, what to do. We have to kind of cover a lot of bases. And that leads to creativity. That leads to advancement. That leads to new ideas that, that could be beneficial in general. Uh, but it also leads to you know lots of other activities. So it's it's nice to be in the middle where you have some uncertainty, but you kind of know what you got to do. Uh, at least in this, the, the uncertainty is in many realms. You're just talking climate here as an example. But. I liked how you framed the question of decoupling uncertainty and risk, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do um, based on how, well, we are a risk society and once statistics came into play, that's how everything has been um, framed for us. So to me, I don't, I obviously do not have the answer, but that is the question is how to decouple uncertainty and risk. That's a huge challenge. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting that the moment when we begin to create sort of like data portraits of societies, of economies, of epidemics, and so forth, like the late 19th century, this is a moment when we also begin to think about scenario modeling, and we begin to think about what those, what the possible futures emerging from that data uh, could be. And so I think there's, um, you know, maybe to get back to this question of sort of like fiction and the role of fiction actually uh, in engaging some of these kinds of systems, I think that's, that's a place where you can begin to sort of like take this raw data portrait, this raw sort of information and begin to imagine, uh, imagine more broadly, not within the confines of sort of like risk, but maybe within the, um, with the motivations of some sort of like aspiration for, for society. I mean, maybe there's some way that we can take risk and sort of like swap it out for some other value. Um, and then that becomes the motivation for thinking through it, the future of these kinds of systems. It, it comes in different levels too. I showed at the end of my little brief at the beginning the planetary rover where because of delay, we didn't know necessarily what the solution is gonna be. As the future rovers be more autonomous, it's gonna make decisions locally. Uh, so we can forecast fictions of where we think it could be based on what we know, but we don't know which one. So presenting you know, the operators a panoply or a set of possible futures, and then trying to converge that as you get more data. Uh, so at many, many levels, this kind of thing does come into play. Maybe to bounce directly off of this line of commentary, when you're talking about these values, these paradigms, right? I'm curious if we're talking about shifting, decoupling, uncertainty, and risk together, that's a question of shifting that paradigm that intrinsically links them together to begin with. One piece of changing those paradigms is representing, visualizing their impact, right? It's not the change itself, but it's a starting of the conversation, a continuing of the conversation. In your particular practices or in other people's work that you've seen, is there reference to those paradigms? Some people call them socio-technical imaginaries. There's lots of ways of referencing them, of how they impact both how we frame what is, what has been, and what could be. So it's also a way of talking about these connections between past, present, and future when we're trying to understand how we affect change in the environments in which we live. Yeah, it's a really interesting question because at that moment you're making something which is not a design proposal, but it's a sort of like artifact for reflection and kind of like critical, critical understanding, which has many of the same kind of like characteristics of a design proposal, but it has a different sort of intent, right? It's, a, it's intended to sort of like organize a debate and sort of like focus questions around particular sorts of, you know, issues and possibilities and contingencies. And I think this is sort of like, you know, this sort of like critical artifact is something which is 
um, you know, from this data, we can make projections, we can make plans, we can make proposals, uh, but we can also create these sort of like critical moments which are intended for other kinds of uh, reflection and hopefully to sort of like expand the range of places where we might go after, to sort of like force a conversation about where we should go. And so I think actually it's, you know, we're at this very particular moment where this kind of like critical data artifacts or critical data kind of experiences have, I think, a lot to tell us about how we might engage with, you know, the future of the future of real-time nature. Actually, yeah. yeah, I love models that you can play with and see the outcome from. The stuff that we do is more, you know, we can play with some of the parameters, but you're giving people an experience. We're creating an experience, and you can certainly do that to try to get people an awareness of what's happening in an environment. We do it more at the level of an aesthetic and just to see what we can do. But there are things like MIT's En-ROADS. I don't know if you guys know about that. It's a, it's a great framework that came out of the Sloan School where it's, it's about looking at climate change and decisions you can make that can impact the temperature. That's the outcome, right? The global temperature. So you can look at uh, going to this kind of energy source, doing this kind of emissions control, doing sequestration or whatever else. There are a whole bunch of things and you can slide it back and forth and you can see the outcome and the temperature based on the decision you made now. You see it in real time. So you sit there and play with these sliders, it gives you graphs and you can start to look at what decisions you make now can result in in the future, because it depends on a model. It's using assumptions. It, it leads you through some of that. Uh, but it's great to be able to actually play with these ideas and see what the outcome can be. And it's not using sensors so much. It is using data that's coming in. Uh, but I think that's kind, of, that's kind of an intriguing idea, to give people a framework where they can actually play with their assumptions and see what would, would happen. Yeah, I think your question is about the community of users. So obviously, when you're talking to oceanographers, the kind of models you're talking about are very different than a tangible model where you can see how your manipulations change, topography and water flow, which is a much more intuitive understanding of, of process and change, um, like a slider. So I think um, you know how these tools are used or which particular ones are dependent on the community of users. Um, and as I think as designers, um, practitioners, artists, you are working with many different kind of groups, and so I think your approach to the, the tools or question at hand really changes depending on who it is you're in conversation with. Yeah. Coming out of the work we did in Tidmarsh, actually, one of our, our students actually did a, a thesis based on, she developed a tool, I pointed her to En-ROADS and inspired her. Uh, in the end, it was a simpler tool, but it was dealt toward land developers, looking at cranberry farming, re restoration of wetlands. Uh, a landowner has to make a decision. Do I restore this to a natural wetland that can have some uh, environmental uh, benefit, or do I sell it to uh, you know, a developer that, that would make a commercial development there? And, and there are all these different financial as well as economic and environmental factors, and they, all, they have a financial reflection too. So you can look at it as a financial choice, because sometimes it is more beneficial to restore it, right? Because you get credits of various sorts, things like that. So she developed a tool to look at that choice of what am I going to do with my land based on you know whatever data you had about the land, about the landscape, things like that. So tools like this to aid in decisions that could have environmental consequences, and an individual has to make that choice, uh, are going to be more available. Again, they depend on the assumptions that go in, but you can play with them and kind of see what the outcome is. But I, I think there's this there's a moment where some of those decision support tools actually become worlds. So we talked a little bit about the Umwelt and the sort of like notion of um, these many sorts of worlds. Actually, uh, you know, at this specific moment, we have the possibility of thinking about microcosm, sort of like mini worlds, in a way which is, uh, I think, really suggestive for thinking about the future as well. And so when we're thinking about sort of, um, when we're constructing these data proxies, we're also constructing sort of like mini worlds, we're constructing sorts of microcosms where you can have behaviors, where you can sort of like play through actions, where you can um, imagine almost not only interactions, but maybe like emergent societies. And I think that's going to be an increasing part of actually what designers do is think about microcosms or these sort of like, you know, worlds in which we can test behaviors, our own personal behaviors, but also the behaviors of many other natural and artificial agents and see how they begin to combine and influence that world. 
Yeah, I think in wrapping up this panel, just want to say thank you so much to our um, moderator and panelists too in providing such an engaging and thoughtful conversation discussion. Um, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, a few notes. We're going to break for lunch right now. Um, we'll invite all our participants for lunch behind the golden curtain over here. Um, and for everybody else, um, we'll have a workshop hosted by Farzin at 1, just in this area here. We hope you can all um, participate and come. And then we'll continue on with our second panel at 2 p.m. <laughs>